Hi everybody. Um, well, just wanted to sit down with you and uh, invite you into a conversation that Vic and I are going to have. Uh, Vic agreed to meet with me and chat with me today, a little different than we've we've been doing, a little different than what we'll do tomorrow morning as we um, celebrate the resurrection of the living Savior. Um, we're getting together on Saturday, and I want to talk to you about what was going on uh, during what is called Holy Week, or this time in Jesus' life, this last week um, leading up to the, the crucifixion and the resurrection we call Holy Week. And so Christians all over the world right now are engaged uh, this year a little differently than <laughs> what many people are used to, but they're engaged in various um, spiritual Christian religious uh, celebrations and observances of, of this time of remembrance, this time of Holy Week. And um, typically Holy Week starts on, on the Sunday before Easter, the Sunday before the resurrection celebration with what we call Palm Sunday, um, where we remember and it depicts um, in the timeline, the, the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem for the Passover and his, um, his what we call the triumphal entry riding uh, on the donkey and, and uh, the instructions that he had given to his disciples to go and make preparations in the city and to gather the donkey and, and the people of the city of Jerusalem coming out and laying palm branches down and shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, and welcoming him. And there's this, this big throng of excitement as Jesus enters in and really at the, the pinnacle, the peak of his um, popularity among the people and recognition among them, the height of the, the buzz, so to speak, that, that he really was the Messiah and that he was about to do something, that he was going to overthrow the Romans or that he was going to change the government, that he was going to take his rightful place. Yeah, it makes me think of one of those sayings where, you know, people will say, well, that accelerated quickly, you yeah. know, where he goes from being praised and everybody excited about him to come, you know, a few days later, crucify him. <laughs> so, yeah, it just happened so quickly but of course we know that was all part of God's plan and he knew exactly what uh, the sinful people in, the, in those days were going to do and, and he was he had all planned out. Mm -hmm. Scripturally it's like everything moves into slow motion. We have so much more in the Gospels um, as far as written content mm -hmm. packed in on all four of the Gospels during this this one week of time compared to what was written during the whole rest of the time uh, uh, of Jesus on earth. It, it's like everything slows down and every detail is watched and examined mm -hmm. and recorded. Um, and there's a variety of, of days here through this week. So there's Palm Sunday, then there's Holy Monday and Tuesday, which um, most traditions don't have a, a lot of detail about but there are things that in scripture um, that were taking place and and Wednesday and then there's this this strange one that um, I think a lot of us Protestants um, may, maybe don't even um, pay that much attention to or realize all the significance but there's this one called Maundy Thursday um, it sounds like we're trying to say Monday Thursday but it's not it's an it's an old word it's a derivative of a Latin word um, that means commandment and it comes from um, this time on that Thursday with Jesus sitting down with his disciples in that upper room and um, he washes their feet you might remember that and he shares the the what we call the Last Supper with them um, but he also makes that statement of this commandment I give to you to love one another. And that word commandment is this Latin word uh, that gets turned into Monday. And so Monday Thursday is this, this day of this great commandment that Jesus gives to us. The same commandment that we as, as Christians are, are seeking to 
work out and live out in our lives today to, to, to love the world as Christ has loved the world. So in Jesus' day, this day would have been more just Passover type yeah. day. or you know, Well, was Passover more uh, like not just one day maybe for them? It was like a Yeah, so it's a whole week-long celebration. Yeah. So generally there was a specific day of observance towards the beginning of the week which is what we see Jesus sitting down with his disciples and celebrating uh, the Passover meal together. And then towards the end of the seven days, there would be um, uh, another time, and it, it led into the celebration of unleavened bread also. And so it kind of became one big celebration that many families would, would stay in Jerusalem and celebrate the whole time. So. Well... Many of us yesterday perhaps read through um, the biblical accounts of the crucifixion again as part of our celebration of Good Friday. Um, it's always fun to try to explain that to children of why do we call it Good Friday when it all seems to be bad news. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, yesterday we celebrate and remember all the horrible things. We remember the false accusations. We remember um, the soldiers coming up and arresting Jesus um, early, early in the morning on Friday. We remember him uh, being taken back and forth from Pilate to uh, Annas to Herod, um, being, well, wrong order, but uh, being accused and falsely accused and, you know, the false accusers being paid to, to bring up charges against him and, and, um, and the, the fleeing of the disciples and their abandonment. And then eventually, finally, um, Pilate, and against the advice of his wife, um, going ahead and, and, and succumbing to the will of the people and the pressure of the crowd and the political pressures that would have been there and um, and, char and charging Jesus, uh, handing him over um, to the to the soldiers for um, for flogging, for for beating, um, and then finally for for crucifixion and and all of the the horrible things that took place there. The physicality of it is is so much what we remember on Good Friday. The the pain, the suffering, the um, the humility, the um, the humiliation, um, the cruelty of of those soldiers as they mocked him and beat him and and dressed him in robes and twisted the the crown of thorns together to place on his head, all those kinds of things, um, and then late in the night after Jesus had hung on the cross and and said his last words and breathed his last um, and, and, and dies, hangs on the cross and, and gives up his life. Um, and then the soldiers take him down and, and we find um, Joseph comes and, and asks for the body of Christ that he could um, prepare a place for him and, and has a family tomb we find that Nicodemus offers to provide burial spices for that, and then even um, at least Mary Magdalene and perhaps another Mary um, there with her <laughs> following the soldiers and finding out just where this tomb is. And, and so we finish Friday uh, with Jesus in the tomb, and it's late in the evening, and it's turning dark, and it's becoming the Sabbath. And so um, biblically, when we read the accounts often, uh, Good Friday is refers, referred to as the day of preparation. Mm -hmm. That was the, the typical Jewish way of talking about it is it's, it's the day before the Sabbath. It's the day that we clean everything out of the house. It's the day we get food together because we're not supposed to make food on the Sabbath. Um, and so we get the household all together. So there was this big rush taking place of, we've got to get this taken care of. We got to get this done so that we can all get home and onto our, our normal lives. 
Well, Saturday comes, and in our Bibles, there isn't very much about this day, Saturday of Holy Week. Now, it's important to us that we remember the, the prophecies of Scripture that, that according to prophecy, that the Messiah would, would be raised after three days. And Jesus, Jesus even speaking of, his, of himself kind of in code, so to speak, had, had uh, affirmed that prophecy once again when he had told particularly the Pharisees and the, the religious leaders had told them, you know, uh, destroy this temple, referring to himself, we believe, mm -hmm. destroy this temple and in three days um, I'll raise it again. Mm -hmm. So this three days is important and we have, uh, you know, Jesus' death taking place in the evening, late afternoon, early evening of Friday. And so he's, he's buried still on Friday and then he's, he's in the tomb all day on Saturday. And then, of course, Sunday, we look forward to the resurrection of Jesus early in the morning. So I've always wanted to have a conversation or put some thought um, into this day almost of silence, this day of Saturday. What, what's taking place in the silence? What significance does it hold? And as we're celebrating all these other bits and pieces that we have um, biblical explanation to, that we have uh, biblical characters that we remember moving around, and all these stories that we share with our children as we're wanting them to understand, all of a sudden we come to this day of silence. Is there something there for us still as we're remembering? Um, how should it impact our hearts? So, well, and like you said, yeah, there isn't much in the gospel accounts recorded of what the disciples are doing. We assume they're just resting for the Sabbath, I guess. But mm. it, uh, obviously it would have been uh, probably a terribly sad time for them. Mm -hmm. Not just a, oh, well, I'm going to take a rest. Like, they, you know, they probably had a sleepless night or two and um, thinking about all that went wrong. And, you know, some of them you know in person witnessing the you know the the killing of their their teacher and their lord mm -hmm. and, and someone who they had followed for many years and um, thought that you know he was going to be the messiah for them to overthrow the romans and so mm -hmm. yeah all, all these thoughts yeah. probably going through their heads of well that was a waste of three years maybe <laughs> or yeah. you know who knows yeah. and uh you know, it's interesting, too, you think about that um, it's only recorded in the Gospels that uh, uh, one or two women followed uh, Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb to even know where it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also interesting to note, too, that um, it's recorded, I think, in Matthew that there was a that the Jewish leaders asked Pilate for a, some sort of soldiers to guard the tomb because they kind of knew yeah Jesus had said that he would come back to life so they didn't believe it would happen so they're like you know we need to make sure the disciples don't pull a fast one and come steal his body but the other gospel accounts don't even record that there were soldiers there and you get the impression even when the women were going to the tomb I don't even think they expected there to be soldiers there because yeah. they were you know it's recorded that they were just talking like who's going to move the stone you know things like that so uh, there's all this stuff that goes on that they probably found out later <laughs> that this took place in the you know behind their backs so to speak but mm -hmm. all the while they're you know kind of absent from the story that's recorded they're just we don't know what they're doing we don't know where they are if, if they stayed together if they dispersed and went their own way i don't know i guess some of them are probably together for on sunday but yeah, there's very little mentioned. Uh, you're right. You brought up the Matthew passage, which is uh, in Matthew chapter 27. Um, I'm looking at starting in verse 62 here. Uh, we read, now on the next day, the day after the preparation. So that would be Saturday that we're talking of. Um, the chief priests and the Pharisees, like you said, gathered together with Pilate and said, 
Sir, we recommend that when uh, we reckon we remember that when he was still alive, um, that deceiver said, after three days, I, I am to rise again. So they had caught on enough. Sometimes we debate whether they understood that he was talking about himself rather than the actual physical temple. But at least in Matthew's account, they were aware enough that they, they understood that Jesus was prophesying about himself. And it was enough of a concern that they bring it up to the, the high priest, the chief priest here. And um, they say, give us orders uh, for the grave, give orders for the grave to be secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as 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 secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. So they were doing everything they could uh, Friday night, getting ready that, that nothing would disturb, nothing would be in place or cause any problems. So they, set a, they got permission and placed guards. They put a seal on it that anyone would know coming that this is not to be messed with or, or you know, there would be serious, serious lethal consequences. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I also noticed over in the book of Luke <laughs> that there's just this tiny, tiny little mention of Saturday. Um, Luke chapter 23, verse 54 says, it was the preparation day and the Sabbath um, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb, how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So we get to Saturday and everybody scatters. Everybody goes home or to the places that they had made arrangements for in the city as again it's during a celebration time so there's a lot of extra people in the city renting places staying with family members whatever arrangements they had made everybody goes to their places and is mm -hmm. uh, observing, observing the, sabbath. the sabbath as they're supposed to yeah that makes me think of uh, one of the the accusations that people bring up about christianity nowadays that's popular on the internet is that the disciples took mythological stories from other religions pagan religions for example and then kind of fabricated jesus story out of this but you know you get this impression that th even after jesus is crucified and and dead and they feel like oh all hope is lost they still observe the jewish law by uh, uh, observing the sabbath mm -hmm. so it makes you think it doesn't make sense that these same people would then invent a religion based on pagan origins when they were still very devout and sincere in their Jewish heritage mm -hmm. and religion. It wasn't something they would just, oh, yeah, sure, let's throw some paganism and, and we'll fabricate this new thing. You know, it, at yeah. the time, I mean, I think if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, they would have just gone back to living their observant Jewish lives. They wouldn't have taken on any kind of pagan um, influences from Rome or, or any of these things. Uh, that, to me, it seems kind of silly, and that's an example that they just went right back to, okay, well, we're going to observe the commandment mm -hmm. because that was still important to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, even on into the the rest of the, the New Testament, certainly in the early part of Acts, we find just that. We still find those, those early disciples, those early converts um, who who did believe in the resurrection of Jesus um, are still going to the temple regularly. Mm -hmm. Or if they're not in Jerusalem in that core nucleus, uh, if they're out in, in the outer uh, towns, they're going to synagogue regularly. They're mm -hmm. still a part of regular Jewish life, really, until there is enough pressure put on them, there's enough persecution within Judaism that really they're, they're pressed out. And so we see them move more and more and more into house meetings or eventually um, separate churches, especially in Greek towns further out away mm -hmm. from, from Jerusalem, out even from Israel than 
and you see more of that taking place of, of having their own places of worship, their own places of meeting. But yeah, especially early on, they considered themselves very much Jewish. They considered themselves being honest and faithful to the commandments of God and seeking to follow him as purely as possible as opposed to trying to overthrow something. Um, in fact, much of Christian's history and heritage has been um, favor among many governments because the things that Jesus taught us were very much in alignment with keeping the law of the land in keeping the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. And so it has never been a particularly um, rebellious oriented <laughs> faith. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I think about too, going back to the, the Pharisees and the, and the high priest or whoever it was that went to talk to Pilate. Now this was, we assume it was on Saturday, right? That they went to him on the Sabbath when mm -hmm. um, wouldn't they normally have either been home or at the synagogue or I guess even the temple in those days. Wouldn't they have been spending time at the temple and instead they're still conspiring and like worrying about uh, even they even call Jesus the deceiver. They think Jesus is, you know, full of lies and all this stuff. But yeah, they were still so obsessed with maintaining their position of power and control that they you know, we don't get the impression that they were observing the Sabbath, but, you know, that's just kind of speculation because it could have just been part of the day, I suppose. But it seems like, yeah, they should have been in the temple. <laughs> it is a really interesting comparison, though, to um, to begin to think about some of these different um, characters, these different people that we see in the biblical account and how they're responding to the crucifixion and what they must have been experiencing and you know we can only suppose their thoughts a, a little bit um, but yeah there's a there's a big difference between the disciples who seem to be going away and you know last we see them other than peter is is really in the garden of gethsemane fleeing down the hill away from the away from the the, the temple guards um, and to see them kind of in hide excuse me in hiding and in fear I think probably experiencing a lot of doubt a lot of questioning um, certainly in the gospels it, it gives us indication that they really didn't understand still at this point Jesus's foreshadowing of these things and how necessary that they were and that he was speaking of a spiritual kingdom that was to come and not just an earthly kingdom. So there's a lot of shock involved. You see, you, we have them on one, one side and then, yeah, you have these religious leaders who are still nervous, mm -hmm. <laughs> who are still concerned about their lies and deceptions and misdealings and trying to get trying to get done with this messy business that Jesus has been for them this this quiet underminer of their authority this um challenge in spiritual debate and interpretation this um, one that the people at least interpreted and saw as someone who might be a political threat and someone who would even would stir up the disrest between the Romans and the Jews many of these religious leaders were probably trying to hold on to um, the last bit of authority and position and um, status that they had, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially like they had, you know, some level of favor with the Roman government. They mm -hmm. want to keep that too, not to mention the, the high place of honor and power that they had amongst the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really were what was still uh, other than Herod. They were the closest things to what was still being allowed as 
rulers or authorities, mm -hmm. many of them still uh, quite wealthy. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure they were. And holding on to, to what they had. Yeah, and Jesus was probably this, to them, you know, this nobody who challenged their teaching and their ways of doing things and not not challenging the religion but challenging their manipulation and changing of it and mm -hmm. kind of their self seeking you know ways that they would do things to you know give themselves um, more pride and 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 think of themselves very highly when you know you see Jesus come on the scene and he was just the opposite of that he was telling people to be humble and um, to consider themselves as, you know, not so special when they come before God, mm -hmm. and and to be real and genuine before God, and that I don't think I don't think it computed for them. They did not get that. Um, and even going back to what we were talking about earlier with the disciples and the leaders and stuff, not, um, you know, the the people anticipated Jesus on Palm Sunday. Oh, hey, he this guy could be the Messiah. He could free us from, you know, these Roman leaders or whatever. Um, not thinking that, no, the Messiah's purpose was actually to come and die for our sins and suffer and die. Mm -hmm. Even though there's all these prophecies, like in the book of Isaiah, for example, chapter 53, there's all this stuff about that the servant <laughs> will, will suffer and die and that mm -hmm. the sins of all of us will be put on him and um, that he will be pierced for our sins and our transgressions. So... Yeah, all that stuff is there looking back, yeah. and they, they made mention of that in later writings of the New Testament. Like, oh, by the way, <laughs> there's this Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. But at the time, yeah, they had n no concept of that. And, and then especially the leaders, they, had, they did not want to lose their positions or their, um, their, well, their status, I guess, yeah, in society for sure. Yeah. For many of them, they, uh, you know, Early in the Gospels, there was the reoccurring accusation of, of Jesus uh, as he's gained in notoriety, as he began doing miracles, as he began teaching, as he took on the, the language of John the Baptist and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, there was this regular accusation of, hey, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this just the carpenter kid yeah. from Nazareth? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and that seems to have continued with the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders. But of course, then at, at the crucifixion, what it really boils down to, and you know, as they're debating back and forth, particularly with Pilate, they bring up the charge, the strong Jewish religious leader charge, which is, but he claims to be the son of God, mm -hmm. that he claims that deity, that authority that only belongs to God, and that could not go unanswered in their minds. Now, mm -hmm. Pilate really didn't care about that. Yeah. It wasn't until they brought up um, the king language and that he came, <laughs> claims to be a king mm -hmm. that Pilate really took it, seems to take it seriously. And even then seems to have a lot of debate until they just really pressure him. And he even offers yeah. them Barabbas, you know, um, yeah, keeping with the tradition. <laughs> to try to get out of this. He didn't want to be bothered with it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, just to be done with it. But well, and I think that that's like you're saying that that claim that Jesus made of being the son of God, mm -hmm. that's why they refer to him uh, to Pilate as the deceiver. I think that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, they probably didn't like the rest of his teaching as well, but that in particular was the thing that they're like, this has to be a lie. How could he be the son of God? That's the most ridiculous thing ever. Um, and even though that also things like that were prophesied ahead of time, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they, they, they just cannot imagine a mere man being the son of God. And, mm -hmm. and so that is like, as you find out later from the writings of Paul and things like that, that that was one of the mysteries that God revealed to us that, um, no, he came down to not only 
save the Jewish people from their sins, but the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, on this Saturday in between the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, you have this kind of weird pause in the story for, you know, you have this, what seems to be not the climax, but like the, the major problem in the story that the hero is killed and you think oh now what and you have this little kind of day to mourn and and to go man I, what what just happened and the disciples you know even when they hear from the the women they they're just like you get this feeling that they're like dumbfounded sitting around i'm like what and they run to the tomb to find out are they lying or is this is this true you know they didn't I don't I mean I think they were excited to, to hear about that but I think that I get this feeling that when they heard that that they ran to the tomb because they just couldn't believe it they're like um, but yeah maybe um, it's just such a contrast of emotions to go from being in despair to complete joy mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know the, and that's the climax of the story it's like oh my goodness he he conquered death and and that that terrible day of Friday and day to think about on Saturday, it all came around on Sunday. Yeah, for many of them, <laughs> Saturday could probably be characterized as a day of a day of loss of hope, mm -hmm. a day of fear, a day of doubts. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're going about the the religious business, the, the, the cultural, the things you're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, it'd be like for us, you know, they're, they're trying to be good people doing the good Sunday thing, mm -hmm. you know, or for them, the Saturday thing. Um, it makes me wonder what that com what those conversations would have been like as I assume some of the disciples got together you know I, I don't know if they totally split up i don't know if they were in one place of course but they might a little later on it seemed like some of them themselves too yeah they might have just kind of all separated out who knows I mean, uh, it, well and and these these women who went and saw at least where the body was laid and and wanted to be helpful and then they've got this whole day where basically they they've got to stay home they've mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're not confined, but they're they're <laughs> similar to what we're experiencing right now. Their, their tradition was to stay home, to stay in place on the Sabbath, mm -hmm. uh, to do very little uh, travel and moving around. They had rules for some of those things. Kind of reminds me of of us these days going out as little as possible and yeah. and distance, where it, you find yourself in your own thoughts a lot more. And in fact, that's one of the, the purposes of the Sabbath that God has given us, right? A day of rest, a day of reflection, a day of spending time with him like mm -hmm. Adam and Eve did after the creation, uh, what Adam did. Um, mm -hmm. And here they're, they're alone with their thoughts. And for so many of us as people, it's those dark spaces, right? The, the time when we're alone with our own thoughts and the unknown what's around the corner what happens next uh, especially in a situation like this they've been right with him they've been out on the limb right mm -hmm. they're they're associated directly with jesus um, they're known as his disciples they're known as the 12 they're known as the close group around him um, and now he and I assume maybe they thought his power, you know, his protection over them seems to be gone. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that perhaps sense of betrayal, there could have been a sense of this, is, this was all been a lie or at least the question of it. Maybe there were some who were just like really, really for sure, <laughs> but but we don't have any indication that that's the case. There's nothing that s draws anyone out and says, oh, but this one, this one remembered what Jesus said at this point. That doesn't happen until later after Jesus appears to them. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, 
they've got all these emotions and you know these women have gone insane but now now they're at home and Jesus has meant so much to them and <laughs> was so favorable towards women compared to the day and age in which he lived and now now the one that allowed even them to follow and to learn and to sit at his feet and to be respected and to be treated as a spiritual equal who could understand and commune with God mm -hmm. and and now it seems like everything's gone yeah yeah it makes you think that it is a lot like you know times and like what we're going through right now where we are you know told to stay home and a lot of people are finding it to be a difficult time not only because of uncertainty of their financial future or their health or the health of their loved ones um, but also there are times like this like I'm sure the disciples experienced of just God seeming to be absent mm -hmm. like how could he let this happen how could Jesus get killed um, you know he's because I'm sure to them Jesus I can only speculate, but I'm sure Jesus felt unique and special to them. I'm sure there was something about him that drew them to him, his authenticity, his genuineness, his, um, you know, just the fact that he lived with love and principle and with uh, compassion for, for those, but also um, very wise and the teachings that he did or I mean people record in the Bible that his teachings just amazed people and um, even to this day people still are amazed at his teaching and to have this unique you know wonderful person who didn't do anything wrong mm -hmm. I mean in in hindsight yeah he he spoke the truth when he said he was the son of God and that's why they killed him because they didn't believe it but it turns out it was true, but they had this person who was the light of the world hanging out with them, and then when he gets killed, uh, I mean, that that just seems to be completely um, just the opposite of what you would expect from God, who would send somebody like this. You would think, why, why would God let this happen, and why is he now so silent? Like, they don't know what to expect, you know, on that Saturday, and I think often people find themselves in that type of situation in life where you feel like things are crumbling around you mm -hmm. and you don't know where God is and he doesn't seem to be answering your prayers the way you want them to be answered in a timely fashion and um, things going worse and worse and and you just have to think about like Sometimes you have to go through stuff like that, and it just doesn't always make sense. And I think that's something that that Sabbath day uh, kind of reminds me of is that there can be times that it seems like the worst thing happens, and then there's just silence from God. Mm -hmm. And, it, I mean, it's not comforting to say, well, you just kind of have to, you know, get through it, um, and that he will help you through it. But um, it is one of those things that's just part of life sometimes that you have to go through difficult times and sometimes it, you may have to feel like God's not there you know mm -hmm. and uh, but just remember that when we look back at the story now of Jesus that it was a terrible thing however it accomplished the m the most beautiful thing in all of history in that God solved our core problem of sin and separation from him through this terrible thing that he allowed to to unfold the way that it did and part of his plan um, and that we see now that day of confusion and isolation and you know things just not making sense for the disciples eventually it changed their lives to such a degree that we are here today because of their preaching and their mm -hmm. boldness to go out after Jesus resurrection so anyway that's kind of what it reminds me of mm -hmm. thinking about faithfulness yeah, as you were saying that, um, 
just reminds me that oftentimes when when things seem to fall apart when we have been faithful I'm not talking about when we are experiencing the consequences of our sin that we right. know perfectly well and there's natural consequences there's spiritual consequences of our sin but when we have been as faithful as we know to be when as old timers used to say when we've been walking in all the light that we have mm -hmm. when we've been seeking after God and yet life doesn't work and circumstances come up outside of our control and we feel helpless and we feel oftentimes like you're talking about like God is all of a sudden quiet and like our <laughs> some people describe it like it, it feels like our prayers are bouncing off of the ceiling mm -hmm. right like there's no sense of God's closeness there's no clarity of of understanding and thought and sometimes even scripture um, is hard to interpret or feels hollow to us and and we feel lonely we feel abandoned we feel like the disciples all over again like where is God in this time sometimes there is a dramatic pause mm -hmm. before we see what God does you know um, almost like almost like in in a theatrical sense that when when someone is saying something important and there's that dramatic pause. Builds the, the tension and there's, the focus. Yeah, yeah, there's a tension. There's a focus. There's a quieting of the spirit. There's a, a drawing the eyes in that then the movement of God is all the more impactful, all the more um, deep. And in this case, powerful enough to change the entire world for all time. Uh, powerful enough to make a way to resolve mm -hmm. and to absolve all sin for all time for mm -hmm. all who would simply believe. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes God is at work in our lives that <laughs> things feel un out of control and uncontrollable and yet God's about to do something. That, that we don't even know how to anticipate. Mm -hmm. Well, shall we wrap it up? Yeah, so I want to thank you. Thanks for indulging me <laughs> and uh, have, sitting down and having a conversation with me. I've wanted to do this. I've thought about it back in days of doing youth ministry, of having this kind of conversation and, mm -hmm. and the opportunity times never come up. So thanks for, thanks for sitting down with me and, and mm -hmm. uh, shooting the biblical breeze, so to speak. And I uh, want to thank all of you who, who chose to join us and, and check out this video. Um, maybe it is helpful to you in your own devotion, in your own thoughts, as you're remembering the, the wondrous work of Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself, who gave up his own life and went to the cross on our behalf and in the power of God took up his life again to conquer sin and death and hell that we too might have eternal life in him and I don't know what all is going on in your life I know that we're experiencing uh, unique times right now um, whatever it is that challenges you the the fears the doubts the, the loneliness, the sense of separation from God and perhaps from others as well. Um, God understands this. His, he knows what it's like himself and for his children to experience these things. And God is bigger. He is more powerful. He is still in control. And even when we think that somehow um, things have escaped even his grasp, Hold on, because nothing, nothing stops the power of God. He is always in control. He is always in charge, and he will make a way where there seems to be no way. Thank you for joining us.